for the media this morning, we'd ask that if you have a question, you raise your hand in the participant box on the Zoom call. We will call on you, unmute you. Uh, please identify your name and affiliation prior to asking your question of one of the panelists this morning. And we are going to start this morning with Heather Dinich from ESPN.com. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Good, um, Barry, I wanted to ask you logistically, if the tests are gonna be on campus by September 30th, I'm looking at the calendar. Are we talking about three weeks to get athletes ready to play a football game? In your mind, is that enough time to prepare? And logistically, can you just walk us through what they'll be allowed to do and when they'll be allowed to do it as far as preseason training? Well, as far as I understand, uh, our athletes will be able to start practice uh, immediately. And that's what we're talking about right now, about how many hours. Uh, when they should be back to a 20 hour week and um, it actually be more than three weeks in preparation if we're going to play on the 23rd and 24th. So uh, we have plenty of time to acclimate. Our athletes have been working out, uh, you know, e even though we postponed the season, our athletes were still uh, available to work out and, and uh, put in time during the week or conditioning uh, should be good. And uh, they, they certainly should have plenty of time in preparation for, for this season. And if I may ask a follow to Dr. Borchers, can you explain what's different with this testing than we might see in the NFL daily test, Major League Baseball, professional leagues? We've, we've seen bumps in the road, obviously, with, with the pros as well. How, how is this different, not only from the pros, but from what the Pac-12 did? What are we talking about here in terms of uniqueness with what the Big Ten is doing? I think the strategy to be, um, you know, being, being honest is uh, one where we're trying to rapidly identify anyone that may have the virus and immediately remove them from their population, uh, whether that be practice or competition and uh, and it's similar to what you have heard from the PAC-12 with the use of rapid antigen testing. Those tests and their ability to uh, detect those folks uh, who are uh, positive and then using confirmatory PCR testing rather than just using PCR testing, which may require a long turnaround time uh, in some places, you know, at best 24 hours or maybe longer, we believe gives us a great advantage uh, uh, to do so. And, and uh, we didn't, you know, just like everything in medicine, it's not like we invented this, uh, but we uh, investigated it uh, and feel very comfortable with that approach moving forward. And we know that if we can test daily with rapid testing in these small populations of teams, um, we're very uh, likely to reduce infectiousness inside practice and game competitions uh, to near 100%. And we can never say 100%, but we feel very confident that uh, uh, with that approach, um, we'll be able to uh, make our practice and uh, competition uh, environments as risk-free as we possibly can with this testing approach. And, uh, and that's an approach that uh, across all of our 14 institutions and all of our medical experts, uh, we felt very confident in. Our next question is from Ralph Russo of the Associated Press. All right, seen Ralph hi. there. Yeah, hi. I hope you're well. Sorry about that. Um, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll direct this at Dr. Borchers. Um, the 21 day uh, mandatory, I guess, timeout, let's say, for athletes after they test positive, uh, what went into the thinking? That seems to be even a higher bar than I guess even the CDC might set. Uh, wondering what went into that, uh, that plan. Sure. So as we looked at um, some issues around cardiac protocols and cardiac testing um, out of an abundance of caution and because of the need uh, at our 14 institutions to feel responsible to provide information in a registry, you've seen the requirements for our cardiac uh, protocol if an athlete uh, tests positive for COVID at any point and that's confirmed during uh, this, uh, this time period. 
At that point, uh, our experts uh, agreed that uh, it needed to be at least 14 days from that uh, positive test um, at, at a minimum before that cardiac testing uh, uh, was completed and evaluated by uh, uh, cardiology experts and that athlete cleared. And then there's the recommendation that we had, you know, that any athlete who's recovering from illness or injury needs a transition period to go back to their activity. And to be clear, we wanted to make uh, put clear guidelines around that seven day transition period so that effectively an athlete uh, who is COVID positive, the earliest uh, that they could return to competition would be 21 days uh, after being positive. And certainly if you look at our recommendations, if athletes are symptomatic or have other issues, that would be uh, even longer. So it's to provide some clear guidelines from our medical experts uh, around the uh, those evaluations um, and how we would safely get an athlete back to competition. Our next question is from Teddy Greenstein from the Chicago Tribune. Morning, guys. Good to see you all. Um, Kevin, I, I know you said, um, you know, this is about the student athletes. Um, but what has it been like for you since August 11th, kind of all the pressure, all the criticism, and uh, how did you deal with it? And, um, you know, to get to this point today, how does it feel? Yeah, Teddy, good to hear your voice. And as you know, you know, August 5th, uh, the conference, we announced the, the football schedule. And then from the 6th and 7th, just to walk you through, you know, we met with our head coaches and athletic directors and PLPC members and med medical committees. And then August 7th is when we had our standing call with our medical team uh, football had progressed to the point where they were transitioning into full contact. And, uh, and, and that's when our medical team raised serious medical concerns about issues for our student athletes. And, and those range from testing, the contact tracing, the cardiac issues. And so we had our discussions with our C COPC and athletic directors and, and we made the determination uh, from a postponement standpoint is that we needed to, to pause. And you've heard many people talk about that. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it really is a blessing to be here today. I'm just proud to be uh, with a group of individuals uh, within the Big Ten. And I uh, seriously understand what makes the Big Ten the Big Ten. We will take a leadership role. We'll put the health and safety of our student athletes first and foremost. And, and, I, and I'm proud to sit here today to say that we did, that we are so much better and so much more prepared today than we were 43 days ago. Personally, you know, that's, you know, that's one of those situations I know and, and clearly understand. I've been fortunate to, to be in these roles uh, and, and, and during my career, uh, they're complicated and, and, uh, and we have a lot of constituents that we need to make sure that we work with. Um, and so I understand that you and I have had those discussions along the way. Ironically, today is my anniversary at the Big Ten. And so we talked about that, you know, even before I formally started. I, I understand what it takes uh, to, to be in these roles. Um, and I understand and try to understand what it takes to be a leader. And uh, it's not for everyone. And so I'm just proud to be able to work with the chancellors and the presidents and the athletic directors and our head coaches and student athletes and even our families and, and all of the individuals on our campuses, our faculty athletic, our senior women administrators. This is a collaborative effort. This is a collaborative conference. Uh, this has been a very complicated year from a health standpoint, from a pandemic standpoint, from a social justice standpoint. Uh, it's been an interesting year. But the good thing about where we are today, I always ask myself, are we better today than we were yesterday? And are we better today than we were 43 days ago? And the answer is unequivocally yes. We're better as a conference. We're better as a people. And that's why I'm comfortable to go forward and uh, return to competition. So, Teddy, it's good to hear your voice, and I uh, appreciate all of your support, and, uh, and, um, and so I'm glad to, to hear you on the call. Evan, if I can follow up, what was your call like with President Trump? Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was productive. I mean, it was productive and interesting. I mean, my whole focus here is I understand uh, what was important for me. The moment that we postponed the season, my number one focus was what could we do collectively what could we do in a transparent manner? And what could I do personally to create an environment to allow our student athletes to get back to playing the sports that they love in a healthy and safe manner? And so it was a productive call. 
and I'm always interested in uh, who, who's willing to help, uh, regardless of, of the level that they can help in. And so um, had a good conversation and a very respectful conversation. And, uh, and I'm glad to be sitting here today looking forward to kicking off uh, football on October 23rd and 24th. Our next question will be from Lane Higgins of the Wall Street Journal. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Lane Higgins from Wall Street Journal. Thanks so much for convening today and giving us an insight into this decision. Um, one of the things that was spelled out in the release today was the uh, positivity standards for both within the team and within the community. And I don't know who best would answer this, probably um, Dr. Borchers, but I'm curious, how is the Big Ten defining community? Is that, you know, located centrally within the counties where these schools are? Is it the student body population? And, you know, will this data be released? Will it be transparent? Thanks for your question. And I want to clarify the, uh, the metrics that we're going to be using. The two most important metrics to us actually pertain to our teams and those congregate groups, so the staffs, coaches, and teams. And that will be the test positivity rate amongst that team and the population positivity rate for that team. And so if, and we'll be looking at those on seven day rolling averages. We'll be looking at those in the context of what's going on in our university communities, our local communities, our state and regional uh, data as well we're going to be using that data to really drive us forward so that we understand specifically what's going on within our teams and how that compares to what's going on within our communities and being able to be transparent about that data and why we're able to move forward. And so the, the numbers that you see for test positivity rate will be reflected on our team test positivity rate, the zero to 2% uh, for our green area, the caution area of two to 5% and then a red area greater than 5%. And for our population positivity rate, that's the team population positivity rate. So again, zero to three and a half percent for green, three and a half to seven and a half percent for caution, and then greater than seven and a half percent for red. And as we discussed with our experts, infectious disease epidemiology experts in these smaller groups, we believe that these uh, standards are appropriately conservative that allow us to provide a healthy and safe environment and to evaluate that environment moving forward. So. Those metrics are going to be um, available, and one of the things that our committee uh, mandated uh, uh, in our recommendations was that all 14 institutions would agree to share those uh, metrics with the conference, um, and that those would uh, provide some boundaries for us uh, uh, to be able to move forward. And certainly, there's uh, obviously decision-making that can happen at the local level uh, with rates that are less than what we put forward. Um, but when we reach those red rates, um, uh, teams would be uh, um, uh, stopping their activities, practice and game activities for at least seven days until we can reevaluate where they're at. Our next question will be from Dennis Dodd of CBSSports.com. Good. Can you hear me, Kenny? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, congratulations to everyone, by the way, for, for this undertaking. It was a well-deserved what you've accomplished. Um, I guess this is for Barry and maybe Kevin can weigh in. What's the primary motivation for the ninth game? Because at first glance, it does satisfy your, your uh, conference inventory for your media partners. But was there, was there consideration for eligibility for the playoff, aligning with other power fives? And what is the process if all teams don't play nine games or eight games, how's a champion going to be decided? Well, the first question, Dennis, uh, you know, the, the reason we came up with the eight plus nine, we thought it was unique. Uh, we wanted to make the season uh, meaningful. Uh, you, you, you have a number of players that are trying to make a decision whether they, they're in or they're opting in or opting out. Um, so we wanted to make it a, a, a meaningful season for all of them. Nine, nine games was uh, what we felt was very meaningful, uh, very unique in how we decided on playing the ninth game. Um, and then we'll play our division champions. The division champions, East-West divisions, will play for the champ to, to determine the champion of, of the Big Ten. And then, and then real quick, if I could ask Dr. Borchers, um, 
you know, nine games in nine weeks, obviously there's got to be some projection there. These are very safe standards that you've established very close to the, to the PAC 12, I believe, but, but knowing what we know now, what, what is the likelihood of getting in, in the safety, frankly, of getting nine games in in nine weeks? Well, I think from our protocol, obviously, we're going to continue to learn and move forward. We believe that safe protocol will allow us to complete uh, this season. From the standpoint of athletes participating in nine football games, um, certainly uh, we know that, uh, uh, that that's uh, – uh, a significant number of games, but that's been done uh, in the past. It's going to be incumbent upon, obviously, all of our institutions, coaches, and medical staffs to make certain that uh, set health and safety is at the forefront of what we're doing. Um, and uh, uh, we think, uh, and our medical subcommittee recommended that uh, that it was uh, safe to proceed forward, and that uh, if we need to adjust, we'll adjust. Thank you. Next, we have a question from Doug Maurice from cleveland.com. Kevin, um, this is Doug Maurice. I cover Ohio State. Why was your communication with coaches, players, and parents so poor over the last month? Doug, I appreciate your, your question. Uh, from a communication standpoint, um, you know, what, what I tried to do personally and we tried to do collectively is to make sure – uh, that when we had things to communicate, that we did communicate. Um, and again, I mean, you know, one of the easy things to do is to be able to turn around and look back and, and say, you know, what was poor, what was good. Um, again, as I said a couple minutes ago, you know, we're, we're, we're in an environment right now where we, I know me personally, I wake up every day trying to be as positive as I possibly can to the, do the best I possibly can for as many people that I can touch. And I know, you know, where we are, we have 10,000 student athletes. And, and I'll, I'll say this personally, is I really, a lot of the criticism that, that uh, has been, been displayed over the last uh, couple of months, you know, it really, I take it as we have a, we, we're, we're passionate. We're passionate in the Big Ten. We have passionate student athletes. We have passionate families. We have passionate fans. And so I take that from a positive standpoint. And we're going to continually do everything we possibly can uh, from not only a, a health and safety standpoint, but from a progressive standpoint, from a leadership standpoint. There are many things that we did learn over the last 40 days and we'll get better. And, uh, and I, I think that's the goal of life is just to make sure that today is better than yesterday. And so I appreciate your question. I'm looking forward to a great season. I'm looking forward to some great football and other sports. And I'm sure at some point in time in the future, we'll turn around and look back and we'll continually be proud of the work that we've put together and the way that we've worked together in a collaborative manner in the Big Ten Conference to get where we are today. Our next question is from Nicole Auerbach at The Athletic. Hi, thanks for doing this, uh, everyone. Um, I, I guess this question is probably maybe for Sandy or Jim, um, one of the ADs, but what's, what are plans for allowing fans are, are there plans to allow fans? From, uh, from the standpoint of what the, uh, uh, the resolution that the COPC uh, approved, uh, we are not going to permit uh, fans in general sale of, of tickets. Uh, we are looking to uh, see what we can do on a, on a campus by campus basis. Uh, to accommodate the families uh, of our student athletes, both home and away, uh, as well as the families of, of staff. But as a conference, we've made a decision, uh, no, no public sale of tickets. And then um, just a quick follow-up. Um, with, with all of the emphasis on rapid daily testing, um, I was just, maybe this is for Kevin, um, but, but how is the conference going to be paying for that? Yes, and uh, good to hear you. I hope you're well. Um, you from a, from when you say how we're going to pay for it, is that, you know, this will be uh, an expense of the Big Ten Conference. Uh, we're, we're putting our safety protocols and procedures in place, and we thought it was important uh, from a conference standpoint uh, that, uh, that uh, we will be responsible for, uh, for the structure of the agreements for, for our testing uh, and also from the payment uh, for, the, for the testing. Our next question is from Pat Forty of Sports Illustrated. 
Uh, yes, hi. I'm not sure exactly who this is most pertinent to, but uh, with practices starting immediately, when will daily antigen testing start? And will daily antigen testing be available for all fall sports? So our medical protocol is, is that uh, we will start daily antigen testing uh, uh, as soon as possible, but no later than September 30th. Our campuses are continuing with their current testing protocols uh, until that point. Um, that gives us uh, over a three-week runway uh, for this testing uh, process. And, uh, and we know that uh, in discussions with our medical staffs that uh, many of our uh, institutions uh, are going to con obviously continue to follow their current uh, uh, testing recommendations. Um, and as far as the other fall sports, I'll let someone else address that. Yeah, I'll do. And Pat, good to hear your voice. Uh, the answer to the question is yes. This, uh, the daily testing uh, will also uh, be conducted for all of our fall sports, um, which, is, which we thought was imp imperative uh, for the health and safety of all of our student athletes in the Big Ten Conference. So that will occur for all of our fall, fall sports student athletes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. Our next question is from Adam Rittenberg of ESPN.com. Sorry, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this question, thanks for taking the time. This question is probably for Kevin or Dr. Borchers. I just wanted to ask if you had uh, secured testing agreements with any particular companies or multiple companies at this point, or that was still being looked at right now. Adam, we feel very comfortable um, that uh, we, we, we have uh, uh, where we need to be from a testing standpoint, from an agreement standpoint. And uh, so we, we will have plenty, plenty of tests and to be able to, Dr. Borchers has said, to be able to co conduct those tests starting by the end of the month. So we are in good shape from a, from a testing standpoint. So thank you for your question, Dr. Borchers. You can, if you have any follow-up in regards to logistics of the testing, I think you've covered that. No, I think, uh, no, I think, uh, no, no follow-up from me. Okay, our next question is from Scott Docterman of The Athletic. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me on here. Uh, this is questions for Barry and Jim. Uh, when you talk about the, the matchups. Scott, I think we lost you. Okay, yeah, you, there, thanks again. Uh, when you talk about the, this is for Barry and Jim. In the last week of the year, if you have a situation where team number two had already played team number two, would you try to maneuver those matchups to ensure that teams hadn't played yet during the year? Yeah, you know what, Scott, we've, uh, we've discussed that earlier. Uh, that's something that we certainly would take a look at. We wouldn't want to have a repeat game, but, uh, as we put this together and, you know, this is the first time we've run through it. So as we put it together, I'm, sh I'm sure that's something that we will uh, take, definitely take a look at because you wouldn't want a, a, a rematch. And, and a follow-up question I have is as far as locations go, will they all be at East games or are these sites or West sites, or is that yet to be determined? That'll be yet to be determined. Okay, our next question is from Pete Thamel of Yahoo Sports. Hey, everyone. I have a, a question for President Shapiro and a, and a question I think that would go for, to Dr. Borchers. Uh, uh, Morty, it, this is obviously a long and complex process. You mentioned all the hours and phone calls. Could you maybe from 30,000 feet give me a sense of a turning point or two? There's obviously a lot of public pressures that we saw and felt. The NFL going smoothly, Central Arkansas playing football parental protests, I could go through them all. But inside, as you were pushing through, could you maybe earmark one or two distinct turning points that allowed this reversal to happen? Uh, thank you, Pete. I, you know, if each of the 14 of us might have a different answer among the presidents and, and the chancellors. For me, it wasn't about 
political pressure wasn't about money. It wasn't about lawsuits and it wasn't about what everybody else is doing. It was the uh, unanimous opinion of our medical experts. And Pete, that sort of evolved over the course of weeks. Uh, even a week ago, I wasn't convinced to uh, be part of the unanimous decision to move forward. Uh, for me, the turning point was a long conversation with our medical team on Saturday um, with a subset of the presidents and chancellors, and then again on Sunday, and then again, uh, it culminated late last night. But uh, the turning point for me was just that one. As I said before, it was, you know, I'm not a physician. And uh, when the medical team was divided as they were five weeks ago, some people were convinced. I wasn't, as you know, from the vote. Um, but then it turned around over the course of the past week, I would say. And then once we got the testing, the great uh, arrangements pretty much set and figured out how to do it safely. And then um, that's how we move forward. And the question was, when can we be safe in terms of going into full contact practice? And then we had to say, okay, well, once we can get in there, you need a certain number of days before you have the first game. So as Barry pointed out, we examined different starting dates. And the reason we picked that weekend of the 23rd and 24th was when could we be confident from the testing, then how many days does it take for contact practice? And that's how we came out with that date among the four different possibilities. Okay, our next question is from Megan Ryan of the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Hi, I hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, this is a, Kevin, a question for Kevin. Um, I, I know there was a small line about this in the release and you did just address it with the availability of testing, but I was wondering if you could speak to um, the rest of fall sports. Is the intent to have them play at some point in the season two along with football or how will you go about making those decisions and, and getting those uh, seasons started? Yeah, yeah, Megan, good to hear your voice. I mean, one of the things, we have the best athletic directors in all of the country. And so one of the, one or the, one of the focal points uh, starting tomorrow morning when we meet uh, together again is will, to, will be to make a determination. As you know, some of the uh, fall sports uh, championships have already been moved to the spring. <laughs> so we'll talk about that internally. And I'll, as always, follow the, the advice and guidance of our athletic directors, and we'll make the determination at that appropriate time. And then we'll be able to circle back and, and make that announcement uh, too. But we felt uh, from a logistical standpoint, from an operational standpoint, that we needed to, to button down uh, football um, because, one, with the number of student athletes there, we figured once we got that solved, then being able to apply those same policies, procedures, and protocols with of, of the other sports will, will be straightforward. So we'll start having those discussions tomorrow. Our next question is from Larry Lage of the Associated Press. Okay, dealing with some audio difficulties, so we're going to move on. Um, let's next go to Billy Witz from the New York Times. Hey, I'm back. Can you hear me now? Oh, Sorry. Hi. Go ahead, uh, Billy. Okay. Yeah, this, this is for uh, Morty. Um, you know, I wanted to just reference uh, something that Dr. Borchers had, had said about uh, how, the, how the, the rates within the team are more significant uh, than they are um, in, the, in the campus community or the, uh, you know, say the county. And there's a, uh, a bunch of, uh, I, I think by my count, there's a uh, five uh, schools that have had more than a thousand uh, cases in the big 10. And I'm just wondering as, as a university president, your, your campus is closed to freshmen and sophomores this year. You're um, I believe uh, pretty much uh, in, entirely uh, remote learning. I'm wondering if you can, I guess, speak to why you, you know, why you think it's appropriate to play football in those kinds of circumstances. Well, Billy, that's a great question. I've been grappling with that every day, including on the call last night, talking about whether it was appropriate to do it. Um, but came out this very strong view among the medical experts, unanimous view, is they could do it safely. 
Um, as you pointed out at Northwestern, we don't have the first year or the second year students on campus. We do have 968 people in our beds on campus and many thousand outside, including any junior or senior. Um, but the feeling was that, uh, you know, if we could play football safely and where was a way and the Big Ten was going to provide the uh, meet the cost of daily testing, and we were able to do it. You know, there's I don't see any reason why you don't want to go forward, on it, which is why I voted to, in fact, go forward. But I, I did grapple with that, um, thinking that part of the campus is is closed, and maybe you should just shouldn't play football until the campus we hope is open for the winter quarter at Northwestern the first weekend in January. But at the end of the day, I found the arguments that if we could do it safely. We can play football and the other fall sports. There's no reason not to go ahead and do it. And that's why I voted to do it. Uh, the, you have to speak to the other 13 about why they also voted to move forward. And our final question this morning is from Larry Lage of the Associated Press. Thanks for coming back to me. Uh, my question is for Kevin and anyone else who would like to chime in about the cardiac registry. Um, what prompted that research or data? Uh, or anything else you'd like to share in that regard? Yeah, Larry, good to hear your voice, and I hope you and your family are well. I mean, part of the, the, the reason why these protocols are so important, and thanks to the work, again, of Dr. Borchers and Sandy and all of the members of our medical committee are, are critically important. I mean, we have uh, 14 of the uh, best institutions in all of the world, and, and our institutions are known as thought leaders from a research standpoint. And when you have individuals like Dr. Larry Rink at, uh, at Indiana. And so to be able to put this cardiac registry together, it not only will help our student athletes in the Big Ten, but it will help all students, our surrounding communities, and really to the in entire, it could have an impact on the entire, uh, our entire nation. And so when you're able to, to be able to tie in and have an opportunity in a global pandemic to be able to help solve some of these medical issues, especially from a cardiac registry standpoint and to be able to help be leaders from a research standpoint, that was really important. That, that was an important aspect of this. So I'm just honored to, uh, uh, to, to work alongside with our medical personnel in the Big Ten. I'm looking forward to the results that come from this. And I'm looking forward to the, the many lives that, that this will, will continually impact in a positive manner as we go forward and deal with, uh, with COVID-19. 